All right, kids, you can head out to your classes. Everybody else, if you'll have a seat. And uh, if you got a Bible, uh, we're going to continue on in Ephesians chapter 4. Appreciate uh, Preston and uh, Brian preaching while I was gone. And, um, uh, well, a- as they go out, uh, why don't you watch this little video clip? It's actually just a, it's a short little commercial. And if you wonder why in the world is he showing this, uh, you'll, you'll understand uh, soon enough. But hopefully this will set up what we're going to talk about today. Could switching to GEICO really save you 15% or more on car insurance? Was Abe Lincoln honest? Does this dress make my backside look big? Perhaps a GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. I think this is a really good illustration of the fact that uh, most of us have been taught our whole lives not to lie, but that sometimes lying is a temptation. (laughs) Right? Husbands, do not respond to this at all. Do not blink. Do not twitch a muscle. Do not look to the left or the right. But have you ever been faced with this temptation in your life? You have. You've been asked this question. And you've had to debate before the Lord within your heart within about three-tenths of a second because if you wait more than three-tenths of a second, your answer is useless anyway at this point. Amen? Uh, and so, we, we, we know... Right, we're not supposed to lie. Most of us. I mean, you know, now now there's studies that show that the majority of Americans don't think there's really anything wrong uh, with lying. I guess at least under certain circumstances, which would make sense when studies show that most Americans believe that truth is relative instead of absolute. But I, I would say most of us have been trained throughout our lives that we're supposed to be honest, we're not supposed to lie, and those kind of things. Yet, I would imagine that everybody in this room has uh, told some lies in, in, in their life. And so, you know, why is that uh, the, the case? Studies show, uh, if you can, you know, rely on these studies because uh, they're self-reported and maybe people were lying, but uh, st- studies show that the average American lies one to two times a day. Um, or on average, people lie one, one to two times a day, although that is actually skewed. And, and there's some, you know, you read different studies, they say different things. But one thing that's really consistent, and this probably won't surprise you if you've ever known some people that are just habitual, seemingly pathological kind of liars. Studies consistently show that about 5% of the population tell about 50% of the lies. So if you know some people that uh, are contributing more than their fair share, uh, to that, uh, that, that would probably make sense to you. I mean, I know some people that it seems like they are almost incapable of uh, telling the truth. I mean, if they open their mouth, it seems like that, that it, it's a lie. And so uh, we're going to talk about today that honesty is the only policy. In fact, really over the next four weeks, as we continue walking through the book of Ephesians, we're going to get into some real uh, practical, real life issues. We're going to talk about honesty this week. Next week, we're going to talk about anger and love and forgiveness and some things like that. Uh, the week after, uh, we're going to talk about uh, don't steal, but work and, and, and be generous. And, and the week after that, we're going to talk about our words. And so just some very real practical uh, kind of things. Now, let me just kind of set up where we are, review, give us some background. Uh, we're really just going to focus on one verse today, although I'm going to read a few verses just to, to give some background. So uh, remember kind of the main idea, the kind of the framework that we're putting everything in, in the, in the second half of the book of Ephesians, is that we can live out what Jesus expects of us by living out of what Jesus has done for us. And so 
He does have some expectations of us. There's a lot of commands in the New Testament, but he doesn't expect us to do it on our own. The Christian life is not just living for him. It's Christ living in and through us. It's the gospel changing us from the inside out. And then out of that, we live a new life. Now, last week's uh, passage of Scripture uh, really uh, got into some of the specifics of, of, of living a new life. Now, when you look at chapter 4, I think it, it divides out into verses 1 through 16, which we spent a few weeks covering, and then verses 17 through 32, which we're going to spend a few weeks uh, covering. And so uh, last week, and, and well, let's just read verses 17 through 24 just to kind of uh, set this in, in its context. Paul wrote, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk, and, and what's walk mean? live, lifestyle. Don't live as the rest of the Gentiles live, walk in the futility of their mind. In other words, he's saying if you're saved, don't keep living like a non-Christian. I mean, that, that's what that, that means. He says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Um, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. In other words, Jesus has made you new. You're a new person. You have an identity in Him. And so, what do we do? He says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so really the main idea of, of this entire section is, is that Jesus made us new, so we are to live new lives by putting off the old and putting on the new through the renewing of our minds. In other words, uh, positionally we're new in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. We're a new creation, we're a new person in Christ. But he's saying Practically, and, and that's what we've been talking about in this whole section, we're, we're a new person through the gospel. We have a new position. We're justified, but we're being sanctified. So we have to live this out in our lives. The way we live it out is, is our, by the renewing of our minds through the truth of the Word of God. As, as we change the way we think, we can repent. We can put off the old and we can put on the new. And then what we're going to look at in the next few weeks in verses 25 through 32 is some very practical ways to do that. So let, let me give you this analogy for this idea of, of putting off the old and, and putting on the new. Okay, l l let's say that um, you and your husband go to work one day, and after work that evening, there's a, kind of an event that you have to dress up for connected to one of your jobs. And, and so you're going to go to that that evening. But in between, you decide to meet at the gym and work out, and you're just going to get ready for the event uh, at, at the gym, okay? So just kind of imagine this scenario, all right? So you work, you go to the gym. Each of you, you work out for like an hour. So you spend half an hour uh, on the treadmill, half an hour doing weights, and you're just drenched with sweat at the end of this workout. Now, you, you got to go get ready, and like, like I say, it's a formal event, and so he's got like a, a suit and tie, and uh, the, the, the wife, she's got a new dress and cute new shoes that match the dress, which is, that's like a perfect day for a female, right? I mean, the shoes... Apparently, just put it over the top is, is what it seems like. And, and so, you know, so, so, you, so you worked out, you know, you're, you're drenched with sweat. So you go take a shower. You're getting dressed to go uh, to this event. But instead of putting on the suit and tie, instead of putting on uh, the new dress, uh, you put on your sweaty workout clothes. And you go to the event that way. What words would you use to describe that? What did you say? Insane. Okay, what else? Gross. Stupid. What? Smelly. <laughs> Inappropriate. Okay. Here's the point. If we're in Christ, He's made us clean by His blood. He's given us brand new spiritual clothes. We're now 
clothed with His righteousness. But we can put on the sweaty, smelly, stinky clothes of sin again in our day-to-day life and live that way instead of living out this new life, out of this new nature, out of the righteousness of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So positionally... In Christ, you're wearing a new suit. You're wearing a new dress with the cute shoes to go with it. But practically, in our actual day-to-day conduct, is that what we're dressing like? Are we wearing our sweaty, smelly, stinky gym clothes? When people look at us, what do they see? What do they smell? What do we look like? So he says that practically in our obedience and our choices and the way that we live, We have to put off the old and put on the new. And then, like I said, he's not just being theoretical. He gets very real, very practical with this in in verses 25 through 32. And he he deals with some specific issues. He says, therefore, putting away, lying. And and, and the, the words there, putting away, actually come from the Greek word that was used in the book of Acts. You remember when uh, they stoned Stephen and uh, the people who were stoning him took off, stripped off their their outer garments and laid them at the feet uh, of, of Saul who became Paul? It's the same Greek word. He's saying strip off, cast aside, put away, lay down, lying, put off the old. And a specific illustration of that is lying. He says, you know, lay this down. But, you know, we don't live in a vacuum. It's just not doing certain things we're not supposed to do. It's also, you know, putting on the positive, putting on the righteous. He says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we're members of one another. Remember, we're members of the same body in the body of Christ. He says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has as need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So, that's kind of the whole section. That's kind of the background, the context. Now let's focus in on verse 45 or verse 25 today and be, you know, very specific in dealing with this issue of honesty. So let's, let's read verse 25 one more time. He says, uh, therefore, and, and the therefore, this is the application, it connects it to whatever, everything was said before. Therefore, putting away, laying down lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So, Main idea, very simple, is a new person in Christ is to be an honest person. A new person in Christ is to be an honest person. Uh, remember what the Bible teaches. Uh, you know, we're not, our, our goal here is not moral reformation of people who don't know Christ yet. So uh, if, if you're a, not a Christian, uh, what I would encourage you to do is to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. You know, the issue is not cleaning up your lying, although, you know, that you know, I think could make your life better. The issue is what is the truth? Is Jesus really the way, the truth, and the life? But for those of us who are Christians, not, not to become a Christian, not I'm going to stop lying so God will love me, but because God does love me, because Jesus died for me, because He's in my life, because He's transformed me, I need to choose to speak the truth instead of choosing to take shortcuts and lie. To be honest. To be an honest person. Um, let's look at just a, a few other verses here from Proverbs just to kind of give a you know, fuller idea of what really God really thinks about this. Uh, these six things the Lord hates. Now, if God says He hates something, you think that might ought to get our attention These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among 
brethren. Three of the seven have to do with our words. Two, specifically, about lying, and sowing discord is probably going to be involve lies as well. Proverbs 12.22, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. And I hope we're just hearing God's Word and letting it produce conviction in our hearts. Proverbs 14.5, A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Proverbs 26, 28, A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So, I think the, the important question, though, really for us today is this. How do we actually live this out? How do we actually live as an honest person? Because, like I said, I don't have to convince Many of you, if anybody here today, that lying is unbiblical, lying's morally wrong, those kind of things. But, you know, when it really comes down to it, when we're in those moments, how do we overcome the temptation to shade the truth? How do we overcome uh, the temptation to lie, to get ahead, or help ourselves out, or to extricate ourselves from a situation? You know, whatever it may be. And so, look at what this verse says. It tells us to put off lying. So practically, what, what does that mean? And what's God asking us to do today? I, I think He's asking us to make a commitment through the power of His Spirit that lying is just not an option in any situation. That we are committed to being people of the truth no matter what the cost is. But see, here's the lie about lying. I don't know, you maybe have heard this statement before, but uh, you can pay now or you pay later, but when you pay later, the price is always greater. You see, the thing about a lie is it may save you in the moment, but it'll cost you a whole lot more in the long run. That's the lie about lying. That, that, that's what Satan tells us. And so we have to understand that, that it's really not going to help us. You see, everything's going to be uncovered. God says He's going to bring everything to the light. You may be hiding something. You may have a secret. You may be living a double life. You may have told a lie. You may, have th you may think that you're getting away with it. But sooner or later, it's going to come out into the light. There's some that may not be revealed until the judgment day. But my experience is most come out in time, in space, in our lives, sometimes in extremely unexpected ways. But God is great at revealing the truth because He is a God of truth. So I would implore, implore you, if there's something that you're hiding today, go ahead and bring it out to the light. Confess it. Uh, fess up about it. Talk to somebody about it. Be honest. Make it right because it's going to be worse if you wait till later. You say, well, you don't know what it's going to do to my life. You don't know what it's going to do to this relationship, to this situation. I mean, you know, it, it may ruin this relationship. It may ruin uh, my marriage. Can I just be honest with you and tell you that's the lie that follows after the lie because if you're living a lie, it's already ruined. It's a sham. And if you'll be honest about it, if you'll bring it out, there's at least a chance to fix it and there's a whole lot better chance of it being fixed if you'll admit it than if they discover it. And I'm telling you, almost everything gets discovered. I've been doing this for 30 years this month. And I'm telling you, you would be shocked at how often people get shocked by what gets revealed from their lives. It'll come out. So, how are we going to put off uh, lying? First of all, we put off lying this is the context by renewing our minds. Uh, you know, if we read verses 25 through 32 in the context of verses 17 through 24, basically what he's saying, the way we overcome all these things is through renewing our minds and repenting of sin, which those two things are just intimately connected together because the foundation of repentance is a change of mind uh, about our sin. So, we are to re renew uh, our, our minds. That's how we put off lying. Now, uh, let, let me say this. I, I should probably be clear about this. Let, let's define a lie, okay? Uh, a, a lie is an intentional effort to deceive. 
Like, you can make a mistake, and that's not necessarily a lie, right? So, somebody could ask you, you know, what's 20 plus 30, and you say 60. That's not a lie. That's just you're not any good at math, <laughs> right? This should be comforting to some of you, because if that were the case, some of you would be liars who don't really want to be liars, okay? There's a difference in a mistake and a lie, okay? A mistake's unintentional. A lie is intentional. It's, it's, it's an, an intentional effort to deceive someone. So let, let's, let's think for a minute about why we lie. Because remember, if, if we're going to be gospel-centered and not moralistic, the issue is not the externals. The issue is always the heart. And, and everything is a gospel issue. And, and I want to show you when we get to the end of this and talk about putting on truth that part of the solution, part of the way to overcome this is, is to be secure in the gospel of, of Christ. But why do we lie? Let me just throw out a few reasons. First of all, I think there's a pragmatism that we learn from the culture, right? Because in, in our culture, we're taught that there's not moral absolutes, Everything's relative. And so what that means is something is not objectively right or wrong. It means it's based on the reason you have to do it. And so if it's a little white lie, if it's supposedly not hurting anybody, or you know, if it's protecting someone, then it's supposedly okay. Or there are people who take it even farther. There was an, um, some research and conclusions of research that the American Association for the Advancement of Science did a few years ago, and they wrote this. They said, quote, proficiency at lying may be the best measure of advancement with primates much more adapt at it than other mammals and human beings, the most masterful deceivers on the planet. So basically, they're saying it's just part of our evolutionary adaptation and it's part of what puts us ahead of everybody else. And so basically they're saying it's not a vice, it's a virtue. Now, here's the thing about relativism, right? We're inundated with this in our culture, but no, I don't think anybody really believes it. It's, it's a convenient excuse to justify and to be able to pick your own morality. But here's the thing. If somebody lies to you and, and, and deceives you and they swindle you out of some money, is there anybody who's not saying that that's morally wrong? But you can't pick and choose. Either something's wrong or it's right. Uh, it can't be just based on the circumstances. It can't just be based on your opinion. So, you know, sometimes people, they just don't have convictions about lying because just they've adapted the virtues of the culture. Now, for us, We've got the Bible. There's no excuse. Okay? So let, let's move past that. What, what's some other reasons we lie? Greed. It's just business. I don't want to pay any more taxes than I have to. Those kind of things. We take shortcuts. We justify. Uh, sometimes people lie just to flat out hurt other people. I mean, it, it, it's just mean. It, it's, it's, it's revenge. It's wanting to bring somebody down, tear somebody down. I mean, sometimes that's the motivation for lying. Sometimes, and this is probably one of the most common, it's to stay out of trouble, save face, avoid embarrassment, right? Cover up something we've said or done. Sometimes, and this is the southern way to lie, it's to avoid confrontation or hurting somebody's feelings, right? You live in the south, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, it's no problem. That's fine, honey. It's, 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 just, it's, it's just fine. Then you go talk to your friend. You won't believe what she said to me. Right? Southern way of life. But just because something's cultural doesn't make it Christ-like. Um, sometimes it's to get our own way uh, or to uh, advance ourselves in, in, in some way. Sometimes it's to make ourselves look or, or, or feel better. This may be uh, shocking to you, but two of the most common situations in which people lie are, number one, on a resume or an interview when they're applying for a job, and two, on dating sites. <laughs> I mean, that, that may be shocking, but we have a tendency to try to make ourselves look better than, than, than we really are. And so I think with all of these, the root issue 
is, you know, insecurity, pride down on the, the inside uh, of, you know, trying to cover things up, trying to look better, not, you know, being comfortable in our own skin, not being comfortable with who we are in Christ and, and just, you know, being willing sometimes to admit our mistakes or to look bad or to wh- whatever else. So uh, let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, this, this is a little uh, uh, comedy clip from Tim Hawkins, and uh, it's hilarious, but I think it makes a serious point. The first lady in the line, she walks up to me and she goes, would you put your favorite Bible verse under your name for me? Just your name and then put your five, favorite Bible verse under your name. Did you do that? Well, uh, okay. Um, sure. Well, my favorite Bible verse is Psalm 34, verse 8. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. That was my favorite verse. But that night, I forgot the verse. I just blanked on it. You know how sometimes, you, you know, like, sir, when you dress today. You know what I'm talking about? It's like your brain is, yeah, it's just not working. So I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, it's, it's Psalm something. I got to pick something. And I said, oh, I'll just have to make up a verse here. So I did. I picked Psalm, Psalm 38, verse 7. Just picked it out of thin air. Psalm 38, 7. Okay, I did it. Like an idiot, I did them all that way. Tim Hawkins, Psalm 38, 7. Hope you enjoyed the show. So I'm driving home that night. I'm like, oh, Lord. I hope that was a good verse. Oh, Lord, could you change the scripture if it's not just for one night? But he did not hear my prayer. So I get home and I look up Psalm 38, verse 7. And to my horror, it says, Lo, I have a painful disease in my loins. <laughs> and I signed it a hundred times and send it out in my own little mission field. Go! Take the word! Don't forget my line problem! Build schools and hospitals! Don't forget my line disease! Because you know those people looked it up. You know they did. They probably made a big deal out of it. Come on here, sit down, kids. Sit down, we're gonna read this first. Turn the TV off. Get over here. Here it is. Psalm 38, 7. Shh. It says, life first. Shh. It says, lo, I have a painful disease. I shook his hand. I shook his hand. <laughs> Is there any use of me going on with the sermon at this point? Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's why we lie sometimes. Let's think about some ways that we lie, just quickly, because, uh, I mean, sometimes I think it can be a little more subtle than uh, what we realize, what we want to admit. Sometimes we lie through exaggeration, right? Um, you know, saying more than what's really true. We can lie through cheating. Um, Adults, you can do this at work, you do it on your taxes, your expense report, a lot of different things. Uh, It amazes me from talking to teenagers how rampant that cheating is in schools. I mean, it it is ridiculous. Uh, Plagiarism is a way that we both lie and steal, taking someone's words and thoughts and using them uh, as our own. Breaking promises to other people. Breaking promises to the Lord. You ever made promises to God that you've broken? I have. We, we can lie to God. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but we, we can. Uh, betraying a confidence. You tell somebody you're not going to repeat something, and then you repeat it. That's, that's a form uh, of lying. You know, flattery, if you don't mean it, is lying. Uh, sometimes excuses are lies, aren't they? Uh, I mean, it's, if it's not true, if it's true, it's a reason if it's not true, it's a lie. Um, and so, 
We need to usually just try to avoid excuses, I think. Slander. You know, gossip is when you repeat something that you shouldn't about somebody that's true. Slander is when you repeat something about somebody that you shouldn't that's false. It's making a false accusation. It's lying. I mean, that's specifically what the ninth commandment is dealing with. This one may be a little borderline. Like I said before, a mistake is not a lie. But if someone is just chronically inaccurate in what they speak, if that's not lying, it's at least a problem. I mean, if someone is all the time just saying things that are wrong, at some point, I think that you have an issue with the truth. We need to be precise and careful in what we say. Sometimes you can insinuate things about someone, and that can be a a, a lie. Half-truths can be a lie. Now, that doesn't mean that we tell everybody everything that uh, we know, right? If I did that, you all would fire me. I mean, there's a place sometimes where you can't answer questions. Sometimes maybe you have to be vague. But that's different than telling part of the truth to intentionally deceive someone as to what the real truth is. Um, You know what? We can live a lie. You ever thought about that? We, we can live a lie. You can be living a double life. Hypocrisy. You can be a lie. You can pretend like you've got it all together. You can outwardly be doing certain things when there's all these things that you're hiding in the closet. We, we can live a lie. And, and the thing about it is I think, like I said, we know that lying's wrong, but we're, we're good at lying to ourselves. Sometimes we can live in such deception that we don't even realize that we're living a lie or that we've told a lie. Uh, sometimes we, we can you know, just convince ourselves uh, of things, or we can justify things. Uh, this happened a few years ago. I used it as a sermon illustration in a, in a different context a few years ago, but a lot of you know Sarah Philippone, been at True Life for a long time. She's Sarah Marcus now. She got married, but uh, I don't remember. She, I think she was in college. She might have been in high school. She broke her collarbone. And uh, she, she had to have some surgery, and the thing that she was nervous about wasn't so much the surgery, it was getting the IV. And so uh, they told her, you know, at the surgical consultation that, uh, you know, they were going to, like, numb it and do something, and she wouldn't even feel it. And then when it came the day for uh, the, the surgery, they didn't do that. They didn't do what they said they would do. And she questioned the doctor about it, and he said, well, uh, around here, we, we call that the old bait and switch. And she said, well, I don't know what you call it around here, but for me, since I was in the first grade, I've been calling that a lie. And and so we need to call a lie a lie, be honest with ourselves. And I would encourage us to, you know, take this list that's in your notes and just kind of pray through it and ask ourselves, are there some ways here that we're struggling with being honest? I mean, maybe we just wouldn't flat out tell a big old whopper of a lie to somebody. But are there some ways that we're being guilty of shading the truth, not being honest? Um, Third thing here is, why is it wrong? And let me just give you a few reasons quickly. First of all, it goes against the command of God. The ninth command says, you shall not bear false witness against your nature, against your neighbor. Uh, Second, lying goes against the character of God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so, you know, the the idea positionally when we get saved, what Ephesians 4 is saying, is we're putting off the lie, we're putting on the truth. We're no more people of the lie, we're now people of the truth. That's part of our new nature, and so that's how we're supposed to live. In fact, uh, when we lie, we are never less like God And we are never more like Satan. Because Jesus said this in John 8, 44. He said, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and is not standing the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, if we read on into the next chapter and they connect, because the first word of chapter 5 is therefore, it says be imitators of God. So understand, when we speak the truth, we're imitating God. When we speak lies, we're imitating the devil. That's why it's wrong. So lying goes against the new nature of believers. We've seen that in this passage. Lying goes against the body of Christ. I mean, verse 25, that's part of the reason he gave. Speak truth 
uh, to your neighbor. You know, we're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves. We're all part of one uh, body. And so it, it's like we're lying to another part of us. We're lying to our family when we lie within the church. And then the last thing that I want us to think about here, why it's wrong, is, you know, Jesus said that uh, something's known by its fruits. You know, we reap what we sow. The fruit of lies is destruction. The fruit of lies is destruction. You know, think about Martha Stewart. You know, she lied over a $45,000 insider trading thing, ended up going to prison for a year, and estimated she lost a billion dollars of her net worth for lying over $45,000. Lying's destructive to us. Lying can be destructive uh, to others. Yeah, I read an article that talks about how common that perjury is now. People lying in court, even sometimes police officers, and this is certainly not to characterize all police officers, but it talked about a group of officers in New York who came up with something called testilying, where they would like plant evidence or, or lie about doing illegal searches and then lie about it in court so they could get the convictions. But that ruins people's lives. Lying is destructive to others. We know that lying is destructive to relationships. How many marriages have broken over lies, over falsehood, over deceit? Some of you have experienced that. Lying is destructive. That's the fruit of it. That's, that's what we're going to reap. So second then, we put off lying through repentance. The Bible teaches us that habitual lying is an indication that a person may not actually be saved. I'm just let the Scripture speak for itself. Psalm 101.7 says, He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Matthew 12.36, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Our words are a revealer of our hearts. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It doesn't mean if we ever told a lie, we're going to hell, but it means if this is still our character, if we're not repentant, if we're not broken, if we're not changing and, and, and wanting to be different and, and trying to be an honest person, then it's a sign that our hearts have never truly been regenerated. So, how do we repent? We confess it to God as sin. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, uh, to, to confess means to agree with. Literally, it's being honest with God about our sin. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what else we need to do? I mean, the Bible teaches us when something is a sin, not against, just against God, but also towards another person, we need to make it right with that person. I'm sure that there are some of you sitting under the sound of my voice today, whether you're in the room or whether you're online, that you have a lie with someone that you need to make right. There's something you're hiding. There's something you're covering up. There's a secret. It may be related to your spouse. There's something you're doing. Maybe you're watching porn. Maybe you're talking to somebody online. There's something. Maybe you've lied about someone. Maybe you've been gossiping or slandering about somebody. There's something, and it may be one of the hardest things that you've ever done, but if you want to get set free spiritually, if you want to have a chance for this relationship to be what it really should be, you need to go make it right. There's an author by the name of Donald Miller who uh, wrote uh, the following story. He said, I lived for a time with my friend and mentor, John McMurray, where the first rule is to always tell the truth. John and I were sitting in the, in the family room one night when he asked me about my new cell phone. I got it free, I told him. How did you get it for free, he asked. Well, my other one broke, so I took it in to see if they could replace it. They had this new computer system at the store, and they didn't have their records. They didn't know whether mine was still under warranty. It wasn't, I knew, because it was more than a year old. The guy asked me about it, and I told him I didn't know, but it was right around a year. 
Just a white lie, you know. Anyway, the phone was so messed up, they replaced it with a newer model, so I got a free phone. And Mr. McMurray replied, did you ever see that movie, The Family Man with Nicolas Cage? There's this scene where Nicolas Cage walks into a store to get a cup of coffee. And Don Cheadle plays the guy working at the counter. There's a girl in line before Nicolas Cage, and she's buying something for 99 cents, and she hands Cheadle a dollar. Cheadle takes $9 out of the till and counts it out, giving her way too much change. She sees that he is handing her way too much money, yet she picks it up and puts it in her pocket without saying a word. As she is walking out the door, Cheadle stops her to give her another chance. He asks her if there's anything else she needs. She shakes her head no and walks out. I see what you're getting at, John, I say. He says, let me finish. So Cheadle looks over at Nicolas Cage and he says, did you see that? She was willing to sell her character for $9. $9. After a little while, I spoke up. Do you think that's what I'm doing with the phone? Do you think I'm selling my character? And to be honest, I said this with a smirk. I do, John said. The Bible talks about having a calloused heart. That's when sin, after a period of time, has so deceived us, we no longer care whether our thoughts and actions are right or wrong. Our hearts will go there easily and often over what looks like little things, little white lies. All I'm saying to you as your friend is watch for this kind of thing. I went back to the store the next day. It cost me more than nine dollars but I got my character back. That's repentance. That's what Scripture's talking about when it teaches us to have a change of mind that leads to a change of action where we put off the old, put on the new, where we live like a new person. And it's easy you know, to come and talk about that Jesus has forgiven us and He's made us new and these kind of things, but it's in our actions, it's these kind of day-to-day choices that demonstrate whether or not We're really living like a new person. So we're to put off the old, we're to put off lying. But then, quickly, just to finish up, we're to put on the new. We're to put on the truth. We're to stop lying by the power of God, by the grace of God, to choose to speak truth in every situation. How are we going to do that? Well, let me just give you a few practical thoughts, some applications here. Number one, I think if we're going to do this, it has to be a conviction that we fear God more than man. That we fear God more than man. That we care more about what God thinks of us than what people think of us. More about how we look to Him than how we look to others. Well, how do we have the security to do that? Well, we have to realize this is a gospel issue. If the root of this like in the, in the Tim Hawkins video in that section, is fear and insecurity and, and how we're going to look to other people. What, what's the antidote to that? The antidote to that is being secure in who we are in Christ. It's the first half of the book of Ephesians, of realizing that we're graced that we're chosen, that we're accepted, that we're beloved, that we're children of God, that nothing we do or say or don't do or say, however we look outwardly, is not going to cause us to love Him or accept us any more or less, that we're secure in Christ because He died for our sins, He rose from the dead, and He lives in us now. The more that we believe that and the more that we live out of that, the less that we have to impress other people the less we care about how we look to other people and the more we're free to care about pleasing God who has done all of these marvelous, wonderful things for us. It's a gospel issue. The the, the security to be an honest person really comes from our security in Christ. Listen, if somebody's not a Christian... I see why they would have no motivation really to be honest. Just do what you need to do to get ahead. But if we're in Christ, you can't lie without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you can lie and it not bother you, you need to get saved. But also, on the positive side, we can be filled with the Spirit who is the Spirit of truth, who is going to guide us in speaking the truth, who's going to give us the security 
to speak the truth. Three, to know the truth. Listen, if we're going to live as people of the truth, speak as people of the truth, we better be saturated with the truth of the Word of God. Because if we're not, we're going to be deceived so easily, not just in this area, but in every area. Four, we should be committed to speaking the truth in love, which Preston talked about that a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians 4.15. Adrian Rogers said this, he said, Loveless truth is brutal. Truthless love is, is hypocrisy. Love in truth is necessary. Listen, if you're not speaking the truth to people, you don't really love them. Now, we, we can speak the truth in an unloving way, and that's not necessarily right either, but honestly, I would say that's better than giving somebody a lie. But let me add something to this, just real practical. Let's receive the truth. We can make it harder or easier for somebody to speak the truth to us. Right? You're sitting in church. Pastor speaks the truth. Do you get mad about it? Do you pout about it? Do you sulk about it? That says a lot more about your heart than it does about the pastor. Sometimes people leave a church because they don't like something that's said. The issue is, is it true? Is it really the Word of God? Somebody corrects you at work. Do you need to be corrected? Grow up and take it like an adult. In marriage. Like, if, if men, if your wife says something to you, it's true, maybe you don't like it. Do you blow up? You think that's going to make it easier for her to say, speak the truth to you next time? Or if you say something to, you, to your wife, ladies, do you go sulk and pout, all of a sudden you know, receive the spiritual gift of celibacy for the next three weeks because he said something you don't like? Is that going to make it easier or harder for him uh, to speak the, the truth to you? Let's work at receiving the truth. Let's live the truth. Live the truth. Proverbs 10.9 says, He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. Did you hear that? He who walks in integrity, he who's living from the inside out, he or she who the outside matches the inside, who we are in public is who we are in private. He who walks with integrity walks securely. But he who perverts his ways, if we're going astray, if we're living a double life, will become known. And then last thing, I would say we need to realize that with this issue, our fellowship with God and our relationships with others are at stake. We can't be lying and living in fellowship with God. And we can't be lying and building healthy, productive, Christ-honoring, enjoyable relationships. So what do we do with this? Maybe some of you need to admit that you don't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you need to get saved. Maybe some of you need to understand, maybe you think, you know, I'm a good moral person and, you know, everybody's lied and, you know, I've never lied much in my life. And, but, you know, the thing about that, I, I could say that. But the Bible says he who breaks God's law in one point is guilty of all. It only takes one sin to send us to hell. That's the reality. God is perfectly, completely holy. And if we've told a lie, that makes us a liar. And we need salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. Our sins separate us from God. Have you been reconciled to God through Him? If you have been, abide in Him. Find your security in Him. And I would just challenge us, let's make up our minds by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to live in such a way where we tell the truth no matter what. That honesty is not the best policy, it's the only uh, uh, policy. It's plan A, B, C, D, E, all the way through the alphabet, that that is how we're going to live. And, and lastly, I would encourage us, as God's Spirit speaks to us, to repent, to confess to God where we need to. And maybe in some cases, like I said, to go and maybe do one of the hardest things you've ever done and make something right with somebody else. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. This may be a little out of context, but it applies, and I'll close with this, John 8, 32. 
Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You shall know the truth. He's talking about the truth of the Word of God, but it applies to every kind uh, 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 of truth. Adrian Rogers said this. I kind of skipped over this before, but I'll end with this uh, thought if I can uh, find it in my notes. He he said, uh, it's better to be hated for telling the truth than be loved for telling a lie. It's better to speak truth that hurts and then helps than falsehood that comforts and then kills. Let's, be, let's live as people of the truth. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, Your Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, would speak and convict and work in our hearts right now. Pray that He would give us the grace to repent and, and, and to change and, and to live as people of the truth. In Jesus' name. And I just ask You, with their heads still bowed and their eyes still closed, that there's some lies in Your life that you need to ask God's forgiveness for? Is there something you need to go and and, and make right with somebody else? Is that what you need to do with this message today? Maybe you got a, a situation in your life that's a mess. Something that's under the surface. Riley, if you would, close that door, please. Uh, Something that's under the surface. Something that um, you need help with. Maybe you need to come talk to one of our pastors. Maybe you need to make an appointment uh, with Lori, our church counselor, that you need some help in working through this. We'd love to help you try to unravel it. Listen, the longer you let it go, the harder it's going to get to unravel. The longer you let it go, the harder it's going to get to unravel. Maybe some of you you need to give your life to Christ, or you're not sure if you're a Christian, I'd encourage you to come talk to me or talk to somebody you know or fill out your connection card. Let us know that you have questions you'd like us to follow up with you. But let's take God's Word, put it into practice in our lives. Father, I pray that you would help us to be not just hearers, but doers of your Word. God, that you empower us to live this out. God, that you'd fill us with your truth. Help us to speak truth in every situation. Pray that you bless and guide and grow your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. If you need to talk, I'll be at the front. Hope to see you at the church picnic today. Have a great day.